I was very interested in this possibility of using behavioral economics as a lens through which to understand certain barriers to equity in our society. If we understand the barriers to wise decisions, then uh, we can redesign the environment in which decisions are made. Corporate boards are another arena where uh, efforts to increase diversity are playing out. And because businesses play such an outsized role in shaping our experiences, we've placed this amount of uh, responsibility on them that really should be reciprocated with a level of care that I think we, we all deserve. I'm John Bashirs, a professor at Harvard Business School and a behavioral economist. Behavioral economics is uh, centered around the theme of infusing our standard economic analysis with a psychological understanding of how people make decisions. When I first encountered these ideas, actually a couple of decades ago at this point, I was really riveted by the fact that they presented both um, a problem and a potential set of solutions. The problem is outlined by Daniel Kahneman, Amos Tversky, and a number of other researchers in psychology. They have provided us with a lot of evidence that people are subject to systematic errors in their decision making. And uh, this presents an opportunity. If people are making predictable mistakes when it comes to their personal finances or their personal health decision-making, in other situations, it can underlie important prejudices that uh, we hold against individuals because of their uh, membership in certain groups, because of their personal identities. And I was, was very interested in um, this possibility of using behavioral economics as a lens through which to understand certain barriers to equity in our society. If we understand the barriers to wise decisions, then uh, we can redesign the environment in which decisions are made in order to help guide people to wiser choices. This is known as the choice architecture approach. One example of a choice architecture approach would be changing the format in which options are presented to an individual as a way of, of influencing their choice. Another example, a little bit more intricate, might be changing the process by which options are selected from a menu in order to influence choice. And um, the work of, of many, including uh, a lot of work that I've done, has shown that these seemingly minor changes to the decision-making environment can have a big impact on people's outcomes. I'll share two examples of how we can use behavioral economics to influence decision making in organizations. So many employers offer defined contribution savings plans to their employees to help them save for retirement. And these employers are very much hoping that employees will take up this opportunity to prepare for their financial future. A typical way that this employee benefit is offered is to say, uh, we have this wonderful plan available to you. If you wish to participate, please let us know. You'll have to choose the percentage of your pay that's gonna be contributed to your account and how those contributions are going to be allocated across investment opportunities. This is an opt-in system. This is a, uh, a way of inviting people and it's a very common way of um, of providing all sorts of employee benefits. Now, because people live busy lives, because they procrastinate, because uh, they may not be paying attention to all of the opportunities available to them, it takes them very frequently a long time to enroll in a retirement savings plan when it's offered on this opt-in basis. The uh, choice architecture strategy that has become quite popular 
the behavioral economics inspired way of promoting engagement in these retirement savings plans is to turn the logic of this inertia that people exhibit on its head and to automatically enroll people in retirement savings plans. So now instead of having an opt-in system, it's an opt-out system. Employees, if they don't indicate otherwise, are going to be contributing at a default contribution rate into a savings plan invested in a default asset allocation. And there's a lot of research, including some of my own, documenting that this behavioral economics inspired change in the choice architecture just makes a night and day difference in terms of the participation rates in these retirement savings plans. And this has actually become widely adopted in the United States and internationally. And, and what we see when we do uh, an empirical analysis of the impact of automatic enrollment as a system for promoting participation in retirement savings plans is that across many different groups, across uh, groups defined by, uh, by gender, by race, by education level, by income level, um, you see a boost in retirement savings plan participation. So this is a, a policy across a really broad spectrum of the population is, is able to promote more positive outcomes when it comes to financial inclusion. But let me use that as a jumping off point to talk about uh, one of my personal favorite behavioral economics tactics that is a variant on this and potentially applicable in uh, this situation as well as other situations. Uh, so instead of relying on a default, what happens when someone does not take action when it comes to a particular opportunity? This technique is called an active choice technique. And it says, you're not allowed to rely on a default. You as the individual decision maker must tell us one way or the other, which option you select. So instead of being able to rely in the retirement savings context on a default, you're either going to be out of the plan or in the plan at a, at a default contribution rate of asset allocation if you don't take any action. We're saying you need to tell us one way or the other. And the thing that I like so much about this choice architecture intervention is that um, it gives people complete freedom to choose. We haven't tied their hands in any way. We haven't restricted the options that are available to them. We've streamlined as much as possible the process of making a choice. So there's very little friction, there's very little hassle when it comes to expressing what someone's desire is. But then we get a good sense, we're, we're sort of prompting people to tell us what it is that they think is truly in their best interest. And then we're going ahead and implementing that. So we've, we've implemented this in retirement savings plans, we've implemented this in healthcare context, and it can really move the needle in terms of getting more people to participate in beneficial programs. In my work, I've come across a number of different success stories when it comes to promoting equity. One of my favorites actually is, is from a case study I wrote on the U.S. women's national soccer team and its quest for equal pay with the U.S. men's. It turns out, actually, on many counts, they did not succeed in their wage discrimination lawsuit. But uh, at the end of the day, they were able to achieve equal pay with the men's national soccer team via bargaining. The U.S. women's national soccer team was just so tremendously successful at their jobs. They had already won the World Cup four times. They had won the Olympics four times. This just tremendous success on the field, especially in comparison to the, uh, well, the lack of success of the men's national soccer team on the international stage, made it very clear in the eyes of the media, in the eyes of the public, that it was simply unfair for the women's national team not to be paid equally. I don't want to at all suggest that it's fair that the women's national team had to be so successful in order to get equal pay. Uh, but I, I do want to uh, suggest that this is a really important factor factor in terms of driving the public conversation that placed a lot of external pressure on the U.S. Soccer Federation when it came to the negotiations that, that ultimately led to equal pay. The U.S. Women's National Soccer Team was, was very clear that their quest for equal pay was not just something that they selfishly wanted for themselves. What they viewed their fight as was a, an emblem for a broader fight for pay equity. And couching their fight in those terms 
was a really important element of helping galvanize the public and galvanize all sorts of actors to really be on their side when it came to this negotiation that they were ultimately victorious in. Corporate boards are another arena where efforts to increase diversity are playing out. In 2011, approximately one out of eight corporate board seats on FTSE 100 firms were occupied by women. And there was a concerted effort across formal government review panel, as well as private actors to really boost that percentage. Over the course of, of really four or five years, they were able to more than double it. The folks who were really spearheading this movement were extraordinarily thoughtful when it came to the sequence of parties that they were approaching in order to build a coalition. They already had a number of allies occupying the chair roles. And actually, as soon as you have those first FTSE 100 board chairs on board, you can actually have them reach out to their fellow board members and make it a very personal appeal. Certain board chairs, for example, went on the public record saying, uh, look, my, my daughter has um, experienced a lot of barriers when it comes to advancing in her career. And I want to be a person who is actively tearing down those barriers. And as soon as you have a critical mass of board chairs who are aligned with this movement, you can go to other parties. So you can go to executive search firms. They start to develop expertise in identifying the female talent. And as soon as you see some positive momentum, all of a sudden the uh, media get involved and they're able to write, oh, there's some excitement among uh, corporate boards in increasing representation. We're gonna highlight the successes of those pioneering board chairs. As soon as um, some other board chairs see that, they think, well, I wanna get in on the party as well. And before you know it, you have um, a lot of momentum moving towards this. The government commission that was responsible for spearheading this, they put out a, a very public target of 25%. They did calculations suggesting that this was uh, achievable. And when they put it out there, all of a sudden that became a rallying point for the business community of the United Kingdom. And people could make a concerted effort together to push towards that goal. Businesses can and should focus on having a positive impact on society because we've collectively placed an enormous amount of trust in businesses. We are uh, impacted by businesses because we are employees, because we are consumers, and because businesses play such an outsized role in shaping our experiences, we've placed this amount of uh, uh, responsibility on them that really should be reciprocated with a level of care that I think we, we all deserve.